Welcome back to Wine Access Unfiltered Season 2. I'm Amanda McCrossa and I'm thrilled to be back after a little bit of an extended break. But I'm here with my co-host, Vanessa Conlin. Are you excited to be back? I'm so excited. It has been a minute. Um, so yeah, thrilled to be back. It's going to be fun. And we've got a lot of new things this season. We really looked at Season 1 it's just looked at everything from a what worked, what didn't work, what do we want to add, what do we want to subtract, and ultimately I think we have come to a really fun new-ish outline for our show. Basically the way that it's going to work is we're going to make these shows a little bit more thematic, so we will still have guests on, but really we wanted to look at the episode structure a little bit differently and have more conversations about wine and ultimately drink more wine, which is really the goal of this entire podcast, I believe. Yes. And you had me sold on the new format when you told me what the theme of this first episode was going to be. <laughs> Shocking. I mean, that was totally on purpose. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> episode one will be on champagne, but I want to open it up with what has been going on in the world of wine in the last few weeks, few months. A lot has happened, obviously, in the last year. Uh, any big news, any big things that you've done in the last year, Vanessa? Well, I would say just this last weekend is pretty big news. So I co-chaired a charity wine auction called Winapalooza here in Napa Valley, which benefits uh, Jameson Humane, which is a local animal rescue, but they also serve the community. They help with things like disaster relief because we've had these, you know, fires here in Napa Valley. Um, and they serve the environment. So it was really exciting. We had people from all over the country fly into town. We had Christy Brinkley as a special guest because she's a real animal lover and a vintner herself. Yes. And we raised uh, $2.2 million, which is a record Ooh. for the event. So that is my big exciting news. That is exciting. $2.2 million, That is not nothing. And of course, former Wine Access Unfiltered guest, Christy Brinkley. It was It was fun to meet her in person. I got to go to the first night and a little bit of the second night. And I have to say, it's one of my favorite wine events of the year. It's, I mean, it's a great charity. It's a great organization, but it is a heck of a lot of fun. So if anyone's interested in getting involved, it is something to put on your calendars like sooner rather than later, because I think tickets sell it pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've had a crazy year. I blew up on TikTok. That was really fun. So I, <laughs> I'm on TikTok now. And uh, I also went to Aspen Food and Wine I think twice since we've recorded, <laughs> they they ended up adjusting. Sounds right. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they adjusted the they adjusted last year is to September. It's usually in June, so I went in September of last year, and then I just I just went again in June, and I hosted a few seminars, one on sparkling wine, but not on champagne. And that brings me to our next point, which is we're talking about what's going on in the wine world. I was lucky enough to attend a dinner with Carmelo Anthony basketball player, wine lover, pretty famous dude. So it was like Carmelo Anthony was there. I mean, Wade. we've heard of him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like kind of needs an introduction. But I mean, the reason we were kind of there was one, we were tasting his brand new wine. So he's got a new Chateau Neuf de Pop. You know, we're seeing a lot of celebrities, a lot of especially NBA players getting into the wine game. You've got CJ McCollum with his project up in Oregon. You've got Dwayne Wade, which is with his project in California. This is really the first that I'm seeing someone of this status move across the world to go do a wine project. And it's this new Chateau Neuf de Pop. But what's interesting is he is diving into the NFT game in the way of Club Divan, which is this new sort of like wine community, like NFT situation. So I'm curious, like, what are your thoughts around this? Do you think that this is something that the wine world should be opening our eyes to? How do you feel about wine and blockchain and NFT and all things in that department. I'm going to be completely honest that I'm still trying to understand what an <laughs> NFT actually is. <laughs> Fair. Fair. So in theory, yes. Um, in actuality, yeah, I, I think it's fascinating. I definitely, um, you know, there's a buzz around it. Also, uh, Dan Petrosky, of course, um, yes. Fitner, owner of Massacan and a friend of, of both of ours is is leaning into that to NFTs and also the... the um, I think going to open a Italian wine bar in the metaverse is the yes. latest I've heard from him. So yes. yeah, lots of, lots of things that I'm, uh, I'm trying to keep up with. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's exciting. 
exciting. And Dan and I have talked about this space for oh, probably two years now. But the metaverse is something that I think is going to be really interesting. Dan is, of course, always ahead of the curve when it comes to doing things a little differently in the wine world. So no surprise that he's sort of first to market in the metaverse with the Massacan wine bar. But I think I think the NFT space is interesting as it pertains to wine. I think it definitely solves a lot of pain points in the way of building stronger communities while we're all living a very virtual world. I think it's I think it's going to be really interesting for wineries who have great presence on the secondary market, meaning, you know, if you're Screaming Eagle and you're selling a bottle for $1,500 to all of your mailing lists, well, if they want to go and resell that, now they can get a, a piece of that resale value if it's sold through uh, through the blockchain. So I think there's I think there's some some things happening here. I know Maureen Downey, uh, of course, acclaimed fraud expert in the world of wine. She's very big into what is going on in this world as it pertains to minimizing the amount of wine fraud in the world. So I think all in all, like a really interesting space. I'll be curious to see who the movers and shakers are, but good sign that Carmelo's involved. Great sign that Dan's involved. I think all is right and headed in, in a really interesting direction because the wine world has been so slow to adopt <laughs> new things. And I think on that note, I, that sort of brings me to this next sort of cultural relevant topic, which is the fact that Anheuser-Busch announced, what was it, earlier this year that they were removing themselves from being the sole sponsor uh, as it pertains to alcohol for the Super Bowl, which opened up other companies to be able to do that, including Gallo. And so Gallo, they're sort of rumoring it's going to be uh, a big player in the world of the Super Bowl. They are the official wine partner of the Super Bowl. I think it's great because I think, you know, lots of people like to drink wine, not just beer during sporting events or concerts, the, the like. So I think it's I think it's great. And, and with Gallo also, you know, they have such a range of price points and different types of wine available that I think it's going to be a really positive change. I do too. I, I'm excited for that. I Gallo has a ton of SKUs, tons of different wines. I hope to see them really play around with that wider portfolio to attract lots of different wine drinkers and not just, you know, the, I, you know, I think it was rumored that like Barefoot was maybe going to be a, a big seller, but I would love to see them use some of their more premium labels too. You know, they, they've got legendary producer like Louis Martini in their portfolio. Of course, they've got all of the Tokalon stuff. So I'd love to see them play around with that. I think it's great news all in all. And then the last thing, <laughs> this has sort of been, this has been a, a cultural event even outside of the wine space, which is the drama between Brad and Angelina continues with Brad oh, yeah. being pissed off at Ange because Ange sold her shares of Chateau Miraval, their, their Provence Rosé uh, project that they've had for years and years now. So um, I don't know. What do we say to that? Sounds like she uh, she kind of did it out of spite, is what I is what I did read, and and he's I think pretty <laughs> upset. Yeah, did him dirty. He's upset because he feels like he you know he's done a lot to build it, and uh, and I love the wine. Honestly, I, I think too. it's a great rosé. I do too, and I think it's on Wine Access right now, right? Yeah. I, I think I actually bought a bottle. It absolutely for is. The July weekend. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it absolutely no, is on Wine Access. It's a it's a great wine, and I will say, you know, Brad though I think he's sober, is very, very involved in the world of wine. He actually launched a champagne project with Pierre Peters. Um, wrote, yeah, Pierre Peters, Rodolphe Peters. I feel bad. I feel like I feel like Brad really had a heart in this project, and he just sort of was blindsided by Angelina selling her shares. Obviously, we don't know all sides of the story, but I hope it all gets worked out because I really do like the wine, and I want to see it succeed, and I want to see him do more things because I think – I think what he's done so far has been really high quality stuff. And of course that gets more people to drink wine, which I'm a fan of. Absolutely. I think he's trying to have the sale voided. Um, but yeah, I mean, and it, it is, I think, I think what you're alluding to is like, he's a celebrity, but he actually has put his heart and soul behind this, which sometimes you don't see when you have a celebrity endorsement or a, or a face yeah. and name associated, yeah. but yeah, he, he seems to really care about the product. So yeah, fingers crossed for them. Fingers crossed. I hope it all works out. One of the things we haven't been so great about, Vanessa, is making these delicious wines <laughs> available that we've been drinking in the podcast. <laughs> uh, kind of a fail on our part. So we 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 heard you. We heard the feedback. Yeah. Uh, we're rectifying this in the way of two things. One is a wine club that we're going to be launching. Uh, it's going to be a podcast wine club. So each 
episode, of course, we're going to be drinking wines. One of those wines will be featured in the wine club. And then we'll also give you guys access to purchase the other bottle that's featured. And this will all be available via SMS. So we're going to do it all via text message. So we'll send you out offers. You'll get updates about what we're drinking. So if you want to go to the show notes below, you can find the links to do all of those things to sign up. I think it's really fun. I'm excited that people will actually get to drink along with us now. It felt lovely to drink with you and our guest, Vanessa, but honestly, like wine sharing is wine caring. So this feels, this feels more our style. Absolutely. Oh yes. It's meant to be inclusive. So we'll all drink together. (laughs) And drink promiscuously at that. If you're liking and enjoying the podcast, we really would appreciate you subscribing to the show. I think that's first things first. If you come back for season two and you're not subscribed, please go ahead and do that. Also, a rating is lovely. We love when you leave us a little review, preferably a five-star rating. If you want to leave it lower, just, you know, think about that twice. Maybe have a glass of champagne before you pull the trigger. <laughs> um <laughs> But we, we love the reviews that, you're, that you leave us. And so I thought maybe we would start by just reading a quick review from Andrea Barr, 0331, who said, love your show. Thank you. I'm learning so many things and getting motivated to try new wines. Remembering a quote from one of your guests as my mantra for today, wine is a beautiful pursuit. Yes, it is. Appreciate your efforts and can't wait to hear more. Keep up the excellent work. Thank you so much for that very kind review. We will be reading one a week. So if you are, uh, if you're so inclined, maybe you'll be the the lucky reviewer of the week. It's kind of nice, huh? It's really nice. It's really nice to hear. And I like that. Wine is a beautiful pursuit and we're never done. (laughs) It's always a journey. And speaking of that journey, our journey is just getting started in the way of champagne. So give us one second to pop the corks and we'll be back with all things bubbles. We've got two glasses in front of us, as always, Vanessa. And you know what? I think we're starting off this season correctly because both of them are champagne, which we love. Maybe you more than me, which I didn't know was possible until I met you. <laughs> but I, I, I suspect, I suspect, given the amount of champagne that you've had, and we won't say what that number is, I suspect that you have like some sort of crazy experience or like fun story with with bubbles. I mean, every story with bubbles is fun. Um, but y- you know, I mean, I think I've been I've been lucky enough to to travel to Champagne a number of times. I love visiting. Um, I want to say the thing that actually blew my mind about champagne more than anything was the first time I saw a sommelier actually decanting champagne, which (gasps) I did not know was a thing. I was in a restaurant and it was not my bottle that was ordered. It was someone else's, but it was at the neighboring table and I was mesmerized and needed to understand why. So I guess even like some young still wines, sometimes you want to get a little bit of air to get it opened up. So I learned the technique where you kind of pour just a little bit in the decanter first and kind of coat the inside. And then when you pour the rest of the bottle in, it doesn't sort of foam up as much. Is that your technique as well? Yes, that's the technique. And decanting champagne was actually how I fell in love with champagne. I I always liked champagne. I didn't love champagne until my very first experience with de- with decanting was when I was first learning to be a psalm I was working at this private club my mentor at the time was having lunch at the bar and he said go grab a wine that you think would pair with this dish and it was scallops and so I'm still a baby psalm at the time I don't know really anything other than I've heard champagne goes with everything so the brilliance in me uh, was like oh well this is like a slam dunk I'm just gonna go get a great bottle of champagne and then like I'll be a rock star so I go get the bottle of champagne I bring it over. It's uh, it's the Palme d'Or, which is the you know a Tete de that really cool bottle with like the the funny shape. So I, I bring it over. He goes, "Great, amazing, go get me a decanter." And I was like, "What the heck is this guy talking about?" So I go get a decanter. He decants the champagne, and he goes, "Underneath every great bottle of champagne is a beautiful still wine." And sometimes we need to decant it to really not only open it up, but also to remove just a little tiny bit of the bubbles to see what's underneath. And because we were pairing it with scallops, which have like a little bit of richness to them, it was great to allow that texture to kind of come through. And so that was my first experience not only with decanting champagne, but it was also the the way that I fell in love with champagne because that first bite with the scallops was like 
mind blown. This is wine, food and wine and food pairing 101. I want more of this in my life. And that really was like, you know, I know we've talked about the fact that I don't really have an aha moment with wine, but it was an aha moment because it got me to understand the value of wine as it relates to our everyday life, should your everyday life include scallops. So, <laughs> so that's how it started for me. But I love that you experienced it as well, because it's a really cool thing. And it's also the reason why we're drinking it out of white wine glasses, or I assume you have a white wine glass or something, right? Yeah, I do exactly. indeed. Mm-hmm. So this is the reason yes. we drink yes. white wine glasses and not flutes or coupes because champagne is really meant to be enjoyed kind of like a still wine in that it should get a little bit of air. You should be able to stick your nose in the glass and smell it. You should be able to kind of move around, not too much. You don't want all the bubbles to dissipate, but it's just a really great way to drink champagne. And in fact, when I was at press, I remember Michelle Roland, you know, great wine consultant of the world who used to come in and he'd always order a great bottle of champagne and he always wanted a burgundy glass for it. He wanted a big fat base for his champagne because he wanted like, he really wanted the champagne to spread out, but it, it really is a thing that you see amongst wine lovers, connoisseurs and in, and in champagne, which you've been to. So they, although they drink them out of tulips a lot over there, right? I mean, anything goes, a tumbler goes there too, but, um, <laughs> I love, <laughs> I actually I love what you said because I think you're exactly right. I mean, underneath this these beautiful bubbles is a still wine and I don't actually have the issue of having a bottle long enough that it does go flat yes. in my house anyway. But but actually it's interesting because if you do taste one where it has sort of lost some of its effervescence, it often tastes a lot like white burgundy yes. and can be really enjoyable just at as is without, yeah. without the bubbles. Um, and I, and I love, I love what you said too about the food pairings because that's, you know, it's not just to start a meal or to give a toast. It's really so food friendly throughout with the, the acidity and so great with like salty, salty foods, fatty foods. And, you know, you can go super highbrow, you can go caviar, you could go fried chicken either way. Totally works speaking my language. It's funny that you say it. It really reminds you of white burgundy because I was just having, I just drank some champagne the other day and we had a bottle of Chablis right after and I tasted it and I was like, oh, it's like flat champagne. And someone was like, oh my God, it is exactly like flat champagne. <laughs> like in a good way though, right? Like yeah. there, really, there really is a strong through line there. So um, yeah, I, I love champagne. It is certainly not just for celebrations. It's not something that we reserve only for special occasions. It is really a wine lover's go-to all-around beverage that can do a lot of things. But I think there's a lot that people maybe don't understand about champagne. I know when I was first getting into it, I just sort of assumed that like bubbles were bubbles were bubbles. And as I sort of went down the rabbit hole, I obviously discovered that bubbles are not all created equally and even within the region of champagne. So we'll start a little bit with the basics about, you know, what exactly is champagne? And given that you are the resident master of wine, I'll let you kick it off with the fun facts about champagne. Something that you might have heard before, but it's true, is that it, it actually can't be called champagne unless it's from the region of Champagne. So um, you can call it Champagne method or traditional method or method traditional, but Champagne in the region, it's like a copyright essentially. So only Champagne from the region of Champagne is true Champagne. You can make wine in the same method, let's say for instance, elsewhere in France, but you would call that a Cremant. So um, so that's one thing to know. It's um, it's a region that is really on the kind of northernmost possibility for ripening grapes. It's at about 50 degrees um, latitude. So it's, it's, um, and it's cool. The average temperature is, is about like a 50 degree average. I go, I was wrong about the latitude. Sorry. It's one of the highest latitudes, 50 degrees average temperature, but it has a really unique situation that allows for the ripening of grapes there. So one is there are forests that surround the region, which sort of brings up the overall temperature. Another thing is the way that the grapes are actually planted. So mostly on hillsides with aspects towards the sun, which can aid in ripening. Now, also, we've had some uh, warmer vintages. There's some climate changes happening uh, throughout the world of wine. So that is sort of assisted with ripeness as well. Uh, but I think one of the the most unique things about the actual region itself is the, the soil and specifically this kind of chalky soil. So yeah. this white chalk that you'll see in the region, it allows for a number of really favorable conditions for the vines. One is it's kind of this perfect balance of being able to retain water. So during dry season, it can hold on to some of that water for the vine, but it's also well-drained. 
because you want this kind of balance, you also don't want it to sit in, you know, puddles and have the vines with its feet wet. So it can do that. But then it also, because it's literally this kind of white chalky, it has a reflective nature to it. And that white chalk can actually kind of reflect sunlight and heat onto the vines during the day and then retain it at night. So all of which sort of contributes to this magic where it really shouldn't be possible to make to make wine there, but it turns into this beautiful, beautiful product that I can't get enough of. And I think you said a key word there, right? It is a wine first. You do have to actually make a still wine from these grapes. And the grapes that we're normally seeing there, there's three predominant ones. The first is Chardonnay, and the, which is a white grape. And then your two red grapes, Pinot Noir, and then uh, Meunier or Pinot Meunier, whichever you want to call it. And so when we see different bottles that we'll talk about just a little in a little bit, that's one of the primary differences between bottles of champagne is what grapes actually comprise the actual wine. But it is a still wine first, and we get it sparkling through, as you mentioned, secondary fermentation, which happens in the bottle. So if we think about fermentation as it exists for regular still wine, you've got your grape juice, which is your sugar. You've got your yeast. Yeast eats the sugar and out pops alcohol, right? And so you have that conversion. And during that conversion, CO2 is emitted. And so normally in still wine, that's just sort of racked off. It goes away. Basta. See you later. With champagne, after we have that still wine and we have it in the bottle, we're going to add sugar and yeast and reignite that fermentation. And instead of letting that CO2 go away, we're actually capturing it inside the bottle. And that's how still wine becomes champagne or sparkling wine. And-, and and this magical thing that happens with this second fermentation in the bottle is then the sort of, we call it lees aging, meaning those, those dead yeast cells, they're still in the bottle, they're chopped in there. And this beautiful thing happens called autolysis, which is basically the cells breaking down by their own enzymes. And it gives that kind of, if you have um, sort of brioche or marzipan or that kind of toasty, bready note that Croissant. you get sometimes on champagne, which is croissant, exactly, sort of a baked goods notes. Um, it comes it comes from that. It comes from the from the autolysis. And I think it's it also gives this beautiful texture, can give a more sort of silky, soft, like rounded edge to the acidity as well, which is, you know, pretty unique. It is very unique. And I think it's one of the things that separates champagne from a lot of other regions that produce sparkling wine because there is actually a minim- minimum amount of time that champagne has to stay on the leaves to sort of get that character. So obviously, the longer you're leaving it on the leaves, the more of that those characteristics you're going to get. But I think the it, the minimum is like 36 months, right? For for, for non vintage and yeah, and and 60 for vintage. Although in reality, particularly with vintage champagnes, almost everybody exceeds the legal minimum. Good for them. <laughs> Why not? It's expensive to make too. And I think as we're talking about two champagnes that are very different in price, it's important to note that most champagne the good stuff at least you're looking at a minimum of about 30 to 35 dollars it's not an inexpensive wine to make obviously it takes a lot of time it's an incredibly labor intensive process because in addition to having to let it sit there you also have to riddle it which is often done by hand there's like there's like 15 steps to make champagne so it's not inexpensive and we do see that sort of reflected in the price of it. And of course, champagne can go up and up and up in price. But we've got two different ones today at two different price points. One is at $36. One is at 95 And so we'll talk a little bit about the difference. But I do want to just touch on sort of the history of champagne because I think it's super interesting. And since yeah. we're going to be since we're going to be drinking a couple, well, at least one classic, I don't, actually don't know this other producer super well. This was a wine access find. But I think we should talk a little bit about how sparkling wine and champagne actually came to be. All right. Well, if you know one thing about champagne, it probably has to do with Dom Perignon. Do you have a favorite vintage? I mean, you say that like I get to drink this all the time, Amanda. Don't you? <laughs> I have a favorite vintage. I did recently. Have, <laughs> I did recently have the ten, which is really lovely. The ten is great. That's one of yeah, one of the new releases. My favorite mm-hmm. is the the ninety ninety six. I'm a big ninety six Dom gal. You know, on the many occasions. <laughs> to have it um but anyway Dom, Dom Perignon who who was Dom Perignon why is he important he was a French Benedictine monk born in the 1600s in Champagne his father owned several vineyards after his studies he joined the, the Benedictine mo- monastic order and moved uh to the abbey where he lived for the rest of his life as the abbey cellarer along another monk Dom Terry Ruinard does that name ring a bell looks like Ruinard it sure does 
Yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. two sort of legends in the industry. But that was the secondary fermentation discovery uh, between the two of them. It was sort of by accident. They, of course, were not trying to make sparkling wine, but fermentation was just re-kicking off in the bottle because they weren't completely being fermented dry. And so we had all of these explosions. And so that's sort of how it came about. But any any color you'd like to add in there, Vanessa? Yeah. I mean, cause, because um, the secondary fermentation happened in the bottle, um, the thing is, you know, you explained fermentation, which is, of course, yeast consuming sugar and the byproduct being alcohol and CO2. Um, if if the yeast have not consumed all of the sugar, the uh, fermentable sugar in there, re-fermentation can happen. But at colder temperatures, it will stop or be halted. So and because it's so cold there over the winters, you know, the cellars would get really, really freezing and would stop fermenting, but there was still some sugar left. And then in the springtime, it would start to warm up. And then all of a sudden their bottles were exploding and they didn't know why. And it's because there was, you know, the yeast was, was waking up and coming back to life. And um, they really didn't want this to happen. I mean, I think the biggest misconception about Dom Perignon is that he like invented this, but really he spent his whole life trying to get the bubbles out of right. champagne. <laughs> and it was, and it was, it was really actually quite dangerous. Um, you know, they would suit up in armor before they would go down into the cellars because these bottles would, would just explode. This was before the invent of coal fired glass, which is stronger. And so they just couldn't keep up with the pressure inside of the bottle. So it was actually like pretty dangerous to be making wine. <laughs> I mean, dangerous, but like potentially delicious, right? I mean, you might lose an eye, but like maybe you'll get splashed Danger. in the face with some great champagne. <laughs> Doesn't sound like right. the worst case scenario, aside from <laughs> cuts and bruises. Uh, I think one of the other interesting yeah. things about Dom is like there's this there's this quote: "Come quickly, I am tasting the stars." Have you ever heard that quote or like seen it on a T-shirt? Yes, yes. I love I love the quote. Yes, it's, it's fake. So Dom, <laughs> Darn so it, Dom Amanda! I know. <laughs> I ruin lives. Um, yeah, so Dom didn't actually say this. It's just really good marketing uh, from uh, the 19th century, from the skilled marketers of the, of the champagne houses. Uh, but Dom did, in fact, get it a wine named after him. So Moet, Moet de Chandon, one of the most famous non-vintage champagnes out there. They're, they're Tete de Cuvée, the one that they make only in great vintages, is Dom Perignon, made, of course, for, named, of course, for the great Dom Perignon, who semi- accidentally discovered champagne but also like didn't at the same time (laughs) all very like kind of confusing a weird story (laughs) but a cool story cool story so we've got two different styles of champagne in front of us right now and there are tons of different styles uh within this category we'll start with the four brute which is a wine blended from three sometimes four uh grapes Occasionally, Pinot Blanc is thrown into the mix there. So brute is sort of this term that has become ubiquitous to describe anything that's not the other categories. But the reality is brute is really just a a dryness indicator. So it's to denote that the champagne is not sweet. So you've got brute, then you've got Blanc de Blanc, which is a, a champagne made only with Chardonnay, so white from white grapes. And then you've got Blanc de Noir, which is one of the one that, ones that we're drinking today. This is a white champagne made from red grapes because, as of course, so many of us have uh, squeezed a grape in our lives to see that it, the juice is, in fact, not red coming out of it. It's clear and it's not until we come into contact with those skins that we actually get that color. So Blanc de Noir is a white champagne made from red grapes and then we have rosé which is the other one that we have today so rosé is really interesting so you can have it made in two different ways one is of course by blending uh, both red and white wines and the other is of course the sangue method so that will result in a pink wine so your rosé champagne so those are the four primary types and then we'll talk a little bit about um, vintage non-vintage grower house I mean there's so much to learn about this but we've got two different ones in front of us now the I'll let you start with the Albert Lebrun because I don't know this wine and I I think a couple things to point out on this label especially if you're drinking with us at home is one of course the producer is the Albert Lebrun you've got Blanc de Noir on the front of that label which as we've just described is means it's going to be a white champagne made from red grapes and then the other thing on here is extra brute so that's going to be the dryness indicator so Vanessa I'll let you sort of take us through this champagne 
and what some of this terminology means, what to look for, and how you even came about this, because this is a super fun bottle. Yeah, I, I really like actually that you're relating these terms back to the label, because I think that's a really great way to learn and kind of connect the dots. Um, so yeah, this is a very small producer. We discovered this uh, on one of our trips to Champagne. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I'm in a region is to say like, who, you know, who, who haven't I heard of? Who's like the local favorite? Yes. Um, and come across come of these some of these small producers. So Albert Lebrun, um, small producer in uh, the Mar. This is all grown in the Marne Valley. We can talk about the regions too as part of the discussion. But as you mentioned, Blanc de Noir. So um, this is made from red grapes that have been pressed very gently off the skins, resulting in a, a white wine or a white sparkling wine. But this is actually a hundred percent Meunier or Pinot mm. Meunier, as they used to say, we just call it Meunier now, which I thought was really interesting because often I will see Pinot Noir based um, yes. Blanc de Noir, but I think it's, so this is kind of rare for a lot of region, a lot of reasons. Um, but Meunier, I think can give this kind of like um, warmth, just sort of breadth to the palate. So while this still has like a lot of focus and tension, it also has some 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 richness as well um, going on. But so you mentioned also extra brute. So I love your your explanation of what brute is, but extra brute is it's a designation of the level of sweetness, and this is added after fermentation, the second fermentation is called dosage. So essentially the wines are fermented to dryness. Now we talked at the beginning of the show about this region being so cold, the wines can be quite acidic. And so in some cases they'll add just a little bit of um, sugar right at the final bottling before they put the cork in the cage in. And that's to kind of just balance it out. Now you don't have to, you see all sorts of wines like non-dosage or Brut Nature, which means they haven't done, they haven't added any sugar. Um, so extra Brut is um, up to six grams per liter of, of dosage. And that's still very, very dry. On the scale yeah. of champagne, this is, I would call bone dry and any sweetness is not discernible. And that's the thing because the wines are so high in acid, even when there's a touch of sweetness added, it sort of just adds to the overall balance and complexity often. And you don't even notice it, it being present. I mean, what's, what are your thoughts on the wine? Uh, well, first of all, I love the wine. Second, I, I think, I think this notion of sugar is a really important one, especially as it pertains to champagne. And I'm sure across your travels and, and your experience, you've done dosage trials, right? Where you actually yes. see different expressions of champagne with different amounts of sugar. And so I think I think when we're talking about wine, sugar sort of becomes like a bad word. But in this case, it's it's a good word. And it's a word that doesn't mean sweetness. And to your point, it's a little, it's just a balancing agent. But beyond that, it's more for me, or at least what I experienced during these dosage trials, is it's really something that can enhance the flavors. So I think of it more of a, like a salt versus something that's making it actually sweet. So it's enhancing all of the flavors in there because, you know, it's really hard to to perceive some of the great things that are happening in this wine because the acid is just so unbelievably high and it needs just that little extra lift. So it can actually bring out flavors. It can add, you know, sort of a textural element. It can round it out a little, a little bit, but of course it's going to balance out that acidity. So just something to keep in mind if you're trying to decide, you know, what sweetness level you're going to be at. I should add that when we're talking about brut, that's actually zero to 12 grams of sugar per liter. And so at 12 grams, you're still not really feeling that sweetness. It's really just getting into something that's a little creamier and rounder. It's really not until you get to that next category above that where you're starting to feel maybe just a little bit of that slight sweetness. But at this level, we're not feeling it. We're definitely not feeling it at extra brute. But what I love about this is it's so clean and bright and fresh. So if you're someone that loves like that when you take that first sip and it's kind of got that oyster shell, that really nice sort of saline feel, but maybe a little bit of florality, this is a great champagne to try. And it, you know, it leaves it super clean on the palate. If you want something a little broader, a little creamier, a little richer, uh, you guys also have one that was a discovery called the Brunion, which is still a very dry champagne, but has yes. slight, slightly more richness. But I like this for the precision that it has. And I know that's a word that we use kind of a lot within the wine world that maybe some people don't really understand. But if you if you think about like this wine hitting your palate and just drawing a line straight back, there's just like a preciseness to it. So it doesn't feel like it's moving all of your palate. It just feels like it's it's landing in one particular spot. Kind of an unusual nuanced thing to to 
think about. But as you're as you're drinking this, just you know, picture that line kind of being drawn across your palate. That's so much of um, of what I enjoy about tasting wine. And actually, you know, when blind tasting, that's something I'll rely on a lot. Actually, is I call it like a palate shape, which is a whole you know there there's so much more to wine sparkling or or still that's beyond just what you're what you're tasting but actually what you're feeling and yeah it does have this sort of like linear presence on the palate that is that is really intriguing the other thing that i think we should talk about it, that it, it's sort of along the same lines of sugar right where sugar is such a thing that we talk about in champagne but we don't in other other places where we see still wines is this idea of vintage so we actually don't see the vintage, the year that the champagnes were made very often on the champagne labels. And both of these wines are non-vintage, which means they're blended across several different vintages because as you talked about, champagne is a very cold region, very difficult to grow grapes, very difficult to ripen grapes, very difficult to make wine in general. And so this idea of non-vintage or multi-vintage champagnes really started at the inception of champagne to try to create this style, to try to try to create some consistency so that winemakers had the ability to blend multiple different vintages to create something really great. And so you'll only see vintages on the labels of champagnes when the vintage is really great or when that winemaker feels like it's worth showcasing that as an individual presence versus something that is a blend. I remember the first time, because I always had learned about it being, you know, called non-vintage or seeing it on, um, you know, restaurant wine list as NV. And I remember the first time I saw MV mm. on on a wine list and I was like, oh, I should tell them there's a misprint. <laughs> you said M, like M is in Mary. M is in Mary instead of N like Nancy. I thought, oh, how embarrassing for them. I should tell them. <laughs> but there was this... <laughs> There was this change from calling it. Some people, it's it's correct either way, but um, it's because yes, it's multi vintages, but it doesn't mean that there aren't vintages in there. So it's not really a non vintage. It's a it's a multi vintage blend. And to your point, the the, you, the reason is to have this sort of consistency of of the wine. And it's it's another reason, honestly, that champagne can be expensive is that to have the opportunity to blend wines that are going to be consistent every year, they have to hold back a lot of base wines. So in some cases, they'll have dozens up to, you know, a hundred different tanks full of, of wine that they're holding to blend later to, to have a consistent product. So it's a lot of kind of planning ahead that they have to do to make sure that they can satisfy all of the markets and all of us, you know, thirsty consumers. Yeah. I think Krug is a great example of that, right? The Krug multi-vintage Grand Cuvée is a great example of a house that is creating a non-vintage, multi-vintage style, but is really sourcing from a hundred years of still wines that they've made. And this is not an easy feat, right? Like there is no formula recipe that they can, you know, you can't, it's not like making a sauce over and over again, right? Like you've got these ingredients, like there is like a tasting panel that has to sit down and figure out how to make this very consistent style year after year after year with different vintages yeah. and different, like there's so much to consider. So I always think it's really impressive that we can have a product that has so many variables be as consistent as it is. And so most of the champagnes that we're buying off the shelves in our stores are going to be non-vintage, you know, your Moet, your Vouv. Um, if it's not the Tete Cuvée, these are all non-vintage or multi-vintage champagnes. Uh, in fact, both of our wines, champagnes today, are non-vintage. Mm -hmm. And even though they, they're completely different in style, this is a more classic producer. And we'll talk a little bit about growers and houses in just a second. But our second champagne that we're drinking is the Boulanger Rosé. It is delicious and a selfish choice on my part. <laughs> I really oh, wanted to try this. I no, hadn't had the most recent. You did me a favor. <laughs> <laughs> it was not selfish. It was it was very friendly as well. But yeah, I think this is, I mean, Bollinger or Bollinger, um, it's it's one of the better known houses. Um, such a cool history, you know, with Lily Bollinger. Um, she was very brave during wartime. She would, you know, ride her bike through the vineyards while they were getting shelled and um just a just a really impressive background there. But um, I, I love this. I love this rosé. I think of all types of champagne, I think rosé is the most gastronomic. I think this is the type of like that champagne way. that you can pair with 
almost with almost anything like this could go with sushi you know this could go with grilled salmon it could go with that kind of salty foods that we were talking about but also delicious by itself but this I think you could carry through an entire meal I couldn't agree more I think rosé champagne is one of I think champagne in general is one of the most parable food friendly wines on the planet but rosé champagne in particular remember when I was working in New York I worked at a restaurant called Rotisserie Georgette. It was a chicken house. We did great chicken. And so we'd do these like Sunday brunches. It was called, it was the Renar Chicken Brunch. And so people would come and buy a bottle of Renar Rosé and a rotisserie chicken. And they could have an entire meal from start to finish with rosé champagne. And it paired so beautifully because there is a little bit more texture. There's a little bit more weight. There's, of course, you know, that more of that like red fruit component but it's also really bright and fresh and acidic to pair, you know, to cut through some of that richness of whatever is you're eating. I also, I, I think this is one of those things that people think about uh, as not, maybe not a wine that can pair with it, but champagne and steak, one of life's great wonders. Yeah. Champagne and steak is delicious, especially if you've got a lot going on the table. I think, you know, working at a steakhouse, it was great to serve Napa Valley cabs all the time, but there's something to be said for a little more acidity in your glass when you've got so much on the table, especially if you've got like a nice fatty ribeye or um, mashed potatoes, greens. Like if you've got a lot going on, champagne is the way to go. So Thanksgiving dinner, you know, rosé champagne is not a bad way to go. I love that. Thanksgiving, absolutely. Such a hard meal to pair with. But yes. And and I think this has a fun story too in that um, Lily Bollinger, uh, she took over in I think it was 19. 19- 41 and she was a real traditionalist and she did not believe that she did not believe in rosé champagne. She thought that champagne should only be crystal clear. And word on the street or if you visit is the reason though that she didn't want to make rosé is she thought it was really only for let's say um women of ill repute who oh. maybe had a um interesting oh, form of employment. That's who she thought <laughs> It would enjoy rosé champagne, so she was Lily. quite she was quite set against it. <laughs> I think she'd she be pleased around, now if she was alive. <laughs> I think she would too. I think yes. there's something to be said for rosé champagne. I also think like there is sort of a stigma when it comes to things that are like pink colored that it might be sweet. So I do just want to note that like rosé in no way means that your champagne is going to be sweet. It's just a totally different profile than your white champagne. So. Always look for that brood or extra brood on the label. Um, I think this is this is just saying brood on here. So, of course, that means zero to 12 grams. The other thing we have to talk about is this idea of grower versus house. And so one of the really interesting things in champagne, again, that sets champagne apart from kind of the rest of the world, is that most of your houses don't own the land that the grapes come from. In fact, they're buying a lot of it, and that has a lot to do with the very tricky legalities of the region, but you have your growers who grow the grapes and you have your houses who make the champagne. And for years and years and years and years, those two things were very separate entities. One did one, the other did the other. And only in the last 20, 30, 40 years are we starting to see what's called grower producers, meaning these growers who were growing their own grapes in champagne have decided that instead of selling their grapes, to these big houses where they were blended into these multi-vintage cubes or with other vineyards, they thought that their land was something very special. And so they wanted to make a champagne that reflected more of the terroir aspect of their hard work. And so we started to see a lot more of this grower champagne trend start to emerge in the last 20 years. And so you can get a lot of value out of growers, I think. I think the trend has maybe moved in a direction that the growers aren't as value driven as they maybe used to be but there's also something really (laughs) unique and special about a grower producer and that's not to say that's not to negate a house producer which is what we have here with the with the bollinger but um what are your thoughts on grower versus house grower and houses i think a lot of it um was it's really originally just economics too where we talked so much about how expensive it is to to make these wines you know you have to be able to hold just not only the base wines but the bottles themselves to meet the the aging requirements um, or to age them longer if that's the style of the house. So, so I, I think it was really difficult because some of these growers, they were small. They really, they are, you know, often just family. Maybe it's just a couple of people working the land. And so of course they were selling their grapes to kind of these larger houses. Um, but yeah, it's definitely become 
trendy <laughs> to to talk about grower champagne and and I think you know you can find great quality on both sides you'll find you, you know in some cases the larger houses have an advantage in that they do have like economy of scale um they have space you know they can they can have the opportunity to buy from many many different growers um to get the kind of uh, style they want whereas as a grower you really are tied to your land and and you're going to make what can be a beautiful expression of that place but you also don't have the flexibility let's say that a that a larger house would have so i think you can find sort of more unique um types of wines from a grower, but it doesn't necessarily, and one isn't better than the other. It's just, it's just a different expression. Exactly. No, I think well put. I like both for different reasons. Uh, farmer fizz is another way to, den- <laughs> to talk about grower champagne. Um, <laughs> the, the way that, you know, if you don't know whether a champagne is grower or not, there's, there's a little way to tell it's really tiny. Sometimes it's hard to see, but often you'll see on the back of the label or somewhere on the front, You'll see, and we'll post this on Instagram, little picture of it. You'll see it'll say RM and then usually dash like some numbers. That means that it's a recall to manipulant. So that's going to be a grower champagne, meaning they grew their grapes, they made their own champagne. The the brand is going to be an NM, which is a negociant manipulant. So that means they grow their grapes, but they're actually making it at a different place. And then you've got your Boulanger, which is going to be a house champagne. So I don't think that there's any particular style, like you said, that's better than the other. They just kind of provide different things. And I think it goes back to just like your wine buying style in general. Are you someone that really loves to seek out boutique pr- boutique producers are you someone that likes to seek out something that has like a tried and true reputation I know for me like if I've got like a big party where I'm trying to impress people and you really want that sort of like if you want like Gucci on the front door like you know you buy your house champagnes and then it doesn't become a question and it doesn't have to be a conversation because someone sees Boulanger they see Vouv or they see Krug and they see something that maybe looks a little more recognizable I, but I think there's situations in which maybe if you're hosting a smaller party that a grower champagne is a great way to have a conversation around wine. So both are very valid. Both are great. I like them for different reasons. Do you have a favorite between the two? Um, you know, right now, because I, I'm enjoying the Albert Lebrun, but it's also kind of a, um, it's one that I don't drink quite as much. So I'm enjoying it, but I'm definitely going to have a challenger later with, with some lunch, which will be, I think, fantastic pairing. One, one other thing we should mention too with, um, with rosé in regards to champagne is um, you mentioned there's kind of two ways you can make it. Um, Sagné being one where it means like to bleed basically. So you have a tank of, you know, red wine. So they may, they make a, a still red wine uh, and bleed off, um, bleed off the juice. And so you, what you'll get is this wine that's sort of had some contact with the red the skin. So it has a bit of a pink tinge. But that's actually very rare in Champagne to use the Sagne method. It's it's mostly actually blending white and red wines. And it's yeah. the only place in France legally that you can blend white and red wines to make rosé. Otherwise, you'd have to do Sagne or do like a direct to press, which means, it, again, it just spends a little bit of time in contact with the skins before it's pressed off. So kind of a fun fact about Champagne. Yeah. It's funny. I never realized like how many exceptions to the rule that champagne had, like between like the blending, the non-vintage, the fact that like, you know, sugar is in the, it's like all the things that you think are things that we don't do in the wine world in every other region with every other style. Champagne is sort of like the place that we do. And I think it, it is like what makes it so special. And I think it's what makes it a region that's really fun to learn because it really, it really showcases just the depth of wine in general. And like, every rule there is an exception there is always something to learn there's always something that like I even think I learned you even you talking about your experience there with the forest I didn't know it was surrounded by forests I think that's super interesting so this is one of the reasons that we're always talking about getting out on the wine trail and visiting these places because there is yes something to be gained from seeing these regions I will say I've heard champagne is like miserable to go to in the winter I'm guessing because it's pretty cold. Oh, I, also, I heard it like shuts down. It's in January, really like, cold. Home. Yeah, it's really cold. Even in the summer, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to be um, sunbathing by any means uh, at all. But um, but it, it's it's a must. If you're a wine lover of any type, you have to visit Champagne at least once. We have some some questions. Um, let's start with, uh, will my champagne explode? By the way, these were gathered from some of my TikTok comments. Uh, will champagne explode in a suitcase on an airplane? 
It shouldn't. No, I've, I've, I will tell you, I have traveled many places <laughs> with Jimmy. <laughs> <in my suitcase. laughs> no, it has yeah. the cage over the cork. So as long as that's, uh, yeah, it hasn't been tampered with, it's intact. It, no, it, it will not yeah. explode. And as you said earlier, this unless they drop your bag so from a high area. <laughs> yeah, that would be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yep. Make sure you put fragile in there. But yeah, when I travel with wine, it's usually like in a wine suitcase or like very well packed so that like there's very little. But it's champagne glass is very thick. Um, it's a it's a different glass that is used for champagne than any other uh, wine on the planet. So it's very thick. So very difficult for that to explode. I should also mention when you're opening champagne, once you've removed that that wire cage and I've got like a million, I think you probably do too, a million videos on how to properly open a bottle of champagne, just keep in mind that cork flies mm-hmm. out pretty quickly. And so the warmer your bottle when you're opening it, the more likely that cork is to fly out of it. Obviously shaking it will do it too. But the way that I like to do it is, you know, keep your hand on the top of that cage on, you know, you're going to twist it that six times, six, six times, six and a half times to untwist it. And I keep the whole cage on there and I just twist from the bottom. So just keep that in mind when you're opening because it can fly off as soon as that cage is removed, that cork can go. And we saw like a very unfortunate incident with a, with a professional cyclist recently from, um, from Africa who was opening a bottle of Prosecco on stage and did exactly that. And it hit him in the eye. He ended up having to remove himself from the from the stage the next <gasps> day. So it was kind of unfortunate. But you see it a lot. It's unfortunate. This is appropriate. What champagne does James Bond drink? Oh, well, we have the champagne house in front of us right now exactly. that he drinks. And that's Bollinger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Special champagne of James Bond and the Queen, I think, right? Yep. What We actually covered this. What type of wine glass should I be drinking my champagne out of? We mentioned... White wine glasses are great. Michelle Roland loves a burgundy. Mm-hmm. The coupe is one of those glasses that like just like serves zero purpose. In fact, you know, everyone talks about the fact that it was modeled after Marie Antoinette's uh, bosom. But in reality, like the coupe is, in- <laughs> the coupe is designed so that you would only have like tiny, you would almost like drink it like a shot. So you'd only put tiny amounts of there. And it was like before champagne was really the beverage that we know to be today. So it's fine if you're drinking, I'd say like a lower quality sparkling wine. But for champagne, especially if you're spending money on it, to me, the white wine glass is the way to go. Same goes for the flute. The flute's great for celebratory purposes, for clinking, for cheersing, whatever. And it's great to show those great bubbles. But you're really not getting the full aspect of what you're paying for if you're drinking a champagne out of a flute. Anything you want to add to that? No, I think flutes can be really beautiful because you're you're really able to see you know mm-hmm. the bubbles rising. But if you really want to enjoy, to your point, all of the aromas uh, and flavors it has to offer, then I go with a wine glass. And for the love of God, because I feel like I've just been seeing this a lot lately, especially in movies and TV shows. Hold it from the stem. <laughs> I feel like I feel like every please every show that I watch it's a like, PSA. <laughs> Drinking champagne. This is a PSA, and it doesn't. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me, except it bothers me for you. Where it bothered me, there was this movie on Netflix recently that I watched that they were supposed to be in the wine industry, and they held the glasses. Like I could, I could get over a lot of the a lot of the factual inaccuracies. The one thing that I couldn't get over is the fact that like these wine pros were holding their glass from the bowl instead of the stem, and I was like, all right, this is just. We've gone too far. This is where I draw the line. So if you're going to, if your glass has a stem, <laughs> use the stem. The champagne is really meant to be served cold. Um, of course, if it warms mm-hmm. up during temp, no worries. But, you know, serve it, serve it cold, not not frozen, but cold. And don't warm it up with your paws. Um, <laughs> any any final remarks on uh, on champagne? Anything we missed? I feel like we we did like a deep dive today. I feel like I learned a lot. We talked about Boulanger Rosé. We talked about the Albert Le Brun. Um, What else did we miss? Anything? I think just uh, I know there's a lot of talk about like shortages of champagne yes. in the market, um, which which might be something just just to to discuss because there are, um, you know, we talked about those those reserve wines that they use to have this sort of, you know, consistent blend and they'll hold on to those. But um, there have been a number of kind of short vintages. Um, 21 was really, really difficult. Now, of course, you're not going to see the 21 vintage on the market yet because, of course, there are all these laws about what they, ha- the aging, but, you know, they have to hold back a certain amount um, to, to be able to have a consistent product. So it's not like they're just going to open the reserves because they had one, one short year. So they have to think long-term um, in, in terms of supply. 
But then also, you know, at least what we saw at Wine Access during the pandemic was champagne sales were like through the roof. Yeah. So it's kind of this perfect storm of not having, you know, an endless supply and also really, really high consumer demand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a good point. I mean, there's there's a reason champagne has gotten even more expensive than it has. I think some people are reporting 20, 30 percent higher uh, year after year on prices in the U.S. There's not a lot to go around over the holidays. There was a champagne shortage. So there's not a ton to go around right now. Of course, Wine Access has quite a few. And if you're a member of our wine club, you're definitely guaranteed at least one bottle of champagne. So that's good. That is our first episode of season two, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this new format. As we said, the guests will be back. We just wanted to sort of drink champagne alone for this first episode. (laughs) Selfish that we are. (laughs) But if you enjoyed this show, if you like listening to us uh, talk about all things bubbles and you want to hear more, we'd love to hear from you in the way of a review. It would mean the world to us. And as we said, we'll we'll pick one a week or one every two weeks since that's our cadence to to talk about on air. So maybe you'll be that lucky reviewer that we read the review of. So maybe a good one. Um I hope that this leaves you a ton of information to go to your next dinner party or client event or whatever you've got coming up to make you sound like the champagne aficionado that you are. And I hope that we could play some small role in that. Vanessa, always a pleasure. Please like, subscribe, review. Thank you to everyone who's been listening for season one. We look forward to bringing more episodes in season two. This has been episode one of the Wine Access Unfiltered co- podcast produced by Chappie Cottrell. We are your hosts, Vanessa Conlin and Amanda Crossan, and thank you so much for listening. Cheers.